Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Abby Wilson, and I'm supporting Homes England's Local Government Capacity Centre today. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? So I'm delighted to welcome you to the final session of um, our winter learning programme. So you can see just a little bit of background on the screen on who the local government capacity centre at Homes England are. And we run a series of knowledge sharing sessions on topics that you've told us are of interest to you. So these sessions are created with intensive consultation with you across local government and with a whole range of other partners as well um, to determine where authorities really need um, that support and learning and how this can best be delivered. So today's session is on building for a healthy life. So just a run through of the agenda today, um, we will start, um, obviously you've had a welcome from me and then I will be handing over to Annabelle Keegan from PGA. Um, she'll be providing an introduction um, to Builder for a Healthy Life. She will then pass on to Julie Tanner, who is the Chief Executive at Design Midlands and she's covering the use and process. Then Julie is going to pass on to Dan Roberts from Homes England and he's going to be covering Homes England's perspective and then last um, but not least, we'll move on to Juliet Biggood, who's a um, design review panel member and chair to provide some practical case studies as well. Then we'll finally finish off with the Q&A section and um, just a wrap up at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Annabelle Keegan, who um, is Associate Director at PGA, who will kick off today's session. Thanks, Annabelle. Lovely. Thanks, Abby. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining the call. So just in terms of uh, what we're here to talk a little bit about today. So in the session that we're going to be discussing building for a healthy life and a document that you might not be quite so familiar with, which is a new technical companion to BHL called Streets for a Healthy Life. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about how those can be used to help improve um, the design and of new and growing neighbourhoods. And as we uh, kind of said in the intro, Judith's going to be talking you through some case studies and some examples of good practice. So hopefully we'll be able to get you all up from twos and threes to fours and fives by the end of the session. Um, we'll um, hopefully um, get you to know kind of what the expectations around building for a healthy life are for new developments, uh, the tools and prompts that can help you identify good practice and avoid kind of the common pitfalls that we see on typical developments, and also how the design network could help you in this process. Next slide, please. So uh, Building for a Healthy Life. So uh, Building for a Healthy Life um, was published by um, Building for, uh, um, Design for Homes and it's an update to uh, a previous document called Building for Life 12. So if you flick onto the next slide please. So the latest edition of BHL is the new name for Building for Life 12. If you flick on a little bit more there should be some animation on the right there. Thank you. So uh, Building for a Healthy Life um, is an update to BHL uh, 12 and it was actually published this time round by the National Health Service and it's um, um, in recognition the name change as, um, as a result of the new partnership that was formed to really kind of emphasise the role of healthy lifestyles and health and well-being in the design process and the role that we all have as practitioners in trying to improve kind of health and well-being through the design process. Next slide please. Thank you. So Putting Health Into Place is a um, publication um, and series of publications that was pu published as part of the Healthy New Towns programme. It's a series of four documents and that is the kind of foundation stone of Building for a Healthy Life and it puts in into practice what's called a whole systems approach and that's taking things all the way through from the design stage all the way through kind of the life cycle um, um, of the design process and to the role that the National Health Service has within our health and well-being. So um, the, the, the way that this has been dealt with in BHL is that there's a real focus on the role that the built environment has to play in people's well-being and that the NHS is recognising that healthier places can be planned and designed and set out a 10-point process within the um, Healthy New Towns programme from how this can be achieved. Those principles are embedded all the way through Building for a Healthy Life and have also kind of been picked up in the more recent work that we've done on Streets for a Healthy Life. Next slide, please. 
So um, Building for a Healthy Life follows the same 12 point structure that was in Building for Life 12. As I said, it was written in partnership um, this time round between Homes England, NHS England and the NHS Improvement Group. And it also reflects kind of changes in legislation um, and um, changes that came in through the Healthy New Towns programme, which was also led by NHS England and NHS Improvement Group. The document was put together by a group of professionals who are on the right hand side there, um, a range of disciplines from um, urban design, highway engineering, landscape and architecture. So all of those strands coming together to really recognise the role of placemaking and health in, um, in the design process. Next slide, please. So from a health and wellbeing point of view, the 12 considerations run through three broad headings all the way through on the left hand side at the integrated neighbourhood scale, kind of at a ma macro scale. So talking about how developments integrate into their neighbourhoods and how healthy connections need to be made all the way through down to on the right hand side streets for all which is a much more micro scale about how we can design in healthy parameters and healthy um elements into um into good developments so if you flick on one more there should be an animation pops up so out of those 12 questions six of those criteria criteria relate in some degree to movement which is why um as a result of kind of um wanting to collate some good examples of best practice and finding kind of these were the areas that people often most struggled with in terms of understanding what's good practice. Collaboratively with Homes England, we've prepared a companion guide called Streets for a Healthy Life, which adds a little bit of meat onto the bones around those 12 questions. So if you flick on again. So in terms of the uptake of BHL around the country, there's quite a good degree of uptake already. So if you flick on again. So um, many of local authorities across the country have either cited BHL or um, uh, BHL 12 um, within their local plans or supplementary planning documents. And the um, graphic on the right hand side there shows all the local authorities in green are currently either actively using BHL 12 or building up for a healthy life. Um, and it's been also written into the MPPF as a good tool. I think Julie's going to talk to you a little bit more about that in a, in a short while. So if you flick on again, so in terms of the companion guide that we've been preparing, this is available online and we'll put the chat, um, we'll put the links in the chat window afterwards. Um, but Streets for a Healthy Life has been written as a, a technical companion to Building for a Life 12. It was funded by Homes England and at the moment it's what we're calling a beta testing document and we'd really welcome your feedback on the document, anything that you'd like to include in a second part of the document which will hopefully will uh, be coming out fairly soon. So um, Streets for a Healthy Life is a collation of good practice examples which try to explain in a bit more detail some of those criteria around good practice that are in those six questions that I highlighted on the previous slide. In terms of the internal pages within um, Streets for a Healthy Life, um, it's built on a kind of a foundation stone of an update that's been happening in the last kind of uh, 12 to 24 months of a lot of change that's been happening in um, policy and uh, guidance in the movement um, and transport planning sector. So if you flick on again, some of you might be familiar with these documents, but if you're not, um, these are really kind of the foundation um, stones on which um, Building for a Healthy Life and Streets for a Healthy Life was, was built. At the start of COVID, so kind of back at the start of 2020, um, the Department for Transport published a new document called De Decarbonising Transport. That was um, accompanied as well very shortly after by a document called Gear Change, which sets out the government's policy in terms of encouraging walking and cycling. That was also um, supported by a guidance document called Local Transport Note 120, which tries to explain in more detail um, around the provision of cycle infrastructure. So those three documents really um, represent a really significant change in transport policy and guidance. Um, and they really are looking for an uplift in terms of active modes, which is captured within Building for a Healthy Life. That's also followed through in the National Model Design Guide and the National Model Design Code. And those documents really kind of push beyond kind of the normal levels of expectations of planning applications to really um, uplift the quality in terms of active modes and really try to embed health and well-being into the design process. So 
Within Streets for a Healthy Life, we um, we focus on five principal functions of streets. You might recognise these headings for Manual for Streets. They've been around since that was originally published um, back in 2007. Um, and um, those five principal functions of street cover everything from place, movement, the access functions that streets hold, um, how we deal with parking, and also how we deal with more technical elements around drainage utilities and street lighting. So what we've done within Streets for a Healthy Life is using those five principal functions, we've analysed a series of case studies and tried to pull out good practice. So if you click on again, please. So the pages are laid out as a series of case studies. Um, myself and David Birkbeck have been around the country collating good examples of street design. And we've used colour coded photography to try and break down the principal components of streets with some dimensions, with some um, sort of key notes and key bits of information that might help you to understand why we think that these are examples of good practice. So they use the colour coding on the right hand side throughout the document and highlight elements of those streets that make them good or make them interesting in terms of their role for health and well-being. We also use a similar format to um, the, the, the main building for a healthy life document um, and we use the same kind of um, greens for highlighting good practice and reds for any areas where we think could um, um, uh, warrant improvement. So a lot of the streets examples that we were able to collate, um, obviously due to the fact that they're built case studies, were built prior to either decarbonising transport or local transport note 120 um, being launched. So as a result, many of them don't feature any protected space for cycling. So on some of the case studies, we've highlighted where under kind of changes um, in policy, um, any change might be required in the future for cycling. So if we flick on again, so the intention is that we um, we um, do a part two for Streets for a Healthy Life. And that's um, going to look again at those same case studies. But in addition to kind of looking at photography for the streets, we um, will also try to provide um, plans, technical drawings and kind of technical design details. And at the moment, we've got a kind of shopping list of elements that we think might include carriageway and vehicle track width. Um, junction details, things like T-junctions, crossroads, driveway crossovers. We might include some details for public transport, parking, footways, cycle facilities, trees and um, suds as well. So if there's anything, when you have a look at Streets for a Healthy Life that you think would be really beneficial to you and that you would find really um, useful to have any details for, please let us know in the chat because we'd love to know because at the moment this is very much a working uh, document. It's a beta testing document and Homes England would be really grateful for your feedback on how it's going so far. So um, that's kind of coming to the end of my part of the, the part of the session. So my next slide just gives you a link um, to where Streets for a Healthy Life can be downloaded from. That's also been put in the chat window while we've been talking. And then I've just uh, got a final um, slide to go through with you, which is a quick poll, which is just um, to understand how many of you currently use or uh, either BHL or Streets for a Healthy Life in your area. So if you could answer that, that'd be really great, please. And then I'm handing over to Julie once uh, that poll's been uh, completed. Thank you. Thanks, Annabelle. Hi, everybody. My name is Julie Tanner and I'm Chief Exec of Design Midlands. I'm a planner and I've been involved with building for life and building for healthy life for a long, a long time. And it's really exciting to see how BHL is actually starting to make a difference in some of our new housing developments coming through. Next slide, please. The um, context within which we're working, Annabelle has um, outlined the authors of Building for a Healthy Life and the Building for a Healthy Life partnership and uh, works closely with the design network because the design network helps facilitate the delivery of Building for a Healthy Life. We provide accredited uh, assessors through our design review panels or panels of design experts um, to actually deliver um, building for a healthy life assessments and we work closely with Homes England on that and Dan will cover some of those aspects later and how that delivery happens but it's um, a process that I'd like to explain a bit better for you today because we feel that using the building for a healthy life process can really help facilitate conversations that will lead to 
better outcomes for people living in, in new or improved housing. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, as Annabelle said, design is right back up there in the national agenda. Um, Building for a Healthy Life is referenced in the NPPF. And um, we need to find ways to empower those higher design expectations to help facilitate conversations between the developing community who have their own pressures and obviously the regulatory framework through through planning, through our, our local authorities and wider stakeholders to ensure to ensure that we meet some of those higher design expectations. We feel there's still room for improvement, but the um, we are gathering more and more best practice. And as Annabelle said, through Streets for a Healthy Life, we're showing how um, some really good um, examples are taking place and some really fabulous housing schemes are starting to take place as well. And some of those have come through as a result of um, Building for Life 12 or Building for a Healthy Life. So next slide, please, Daniel. The uh, paragraph 133 in the, in the last version of the NPPF indicates that Building for a Healthy Life is an appropriate assessment framework by which to guide and um, uplift uh, design of development. It's an appropriate tool. It's an appropriate assessment framework. So that's um, really gratifying for those that want to use um, a design methodology to help secure better design outcomes. Next slide, please, Daniel. So what can Design Midlands do to help or um, anyone across the design network. As I said, we um, have an accredited bank of trained assessors. Juliet and Annabelle are both assessors. I, we, I work closely with them to, to support Building for Healthy Life Assessment. And um, they come from a wide range of expertise, architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, master planning, transport, conservation, et cetera, et cetera. So um, through their experience and their knowledge, we bring a more holistic sort of framework together to um, to look at the scope of a of a scheme and understand using the twelve consideration and and building for a healthy life if it's meeting those considerations or if it's if there are justified reasons for why those um, those considerations cannot be met. So um, the Something that we have introduced in the last couple of years is pre-assessments, looking at a site's potential uh, to achieve building for a healthy life. And because it's a very transparent framework through the 12 considerations, it's a very easy way to promote the, um, the, the characteristics of a site and make sure design parameters are established very early on. And because we use the traffic light process, we can see how a site is progressing and how that uplift is taking place as a, as a as the design development phases are undertaken. As I said, you know, sometimes it's about justifying reasons why a green cannot be achieved, and that can be very useful so that expectations are um, are set uh, at a reasonable time. And building for a healthy life is not just about evaluating master plans and design codes. It's obviously really good at that stage because that st sets the parameters for later on, but also it comes right down to the detail as well. And it looks beyond the red line. It looks at the connectivity and the wider um, context of a site to make the most of what's there. Next slide, please. The traffic light system is fairly key to, to how we translate the 12 considerations in building for a healthy life. So if we were to undertake an assessment at um, by Design Midlands assessors, what would generally happen is that an, a site visit one would be undertaken. So the um, so the context of a site is well understood. We would draft a report looking at um, some of the initial draft layouts and drawings and we would give an assessment against those 12 considerations in the form of a draft report. Then we would meet with the local authority and the design team, the, the house builder and if other stakeholders such as the highways authority wanted to be involved and we would work through the 
um, predominantly the ambers and if there are any reds on a site to ensure that design uplift could be met. But what's really um, integral to Building for a Healthy Life is that it is a holistic, so it looks at all aspects of, you know, how a site would function, how it would embed into, into its setting and how it would lead to better health and well-being outcomes. So we can look at BHL potential when it comes to master planning parameters. We can do a detailed design assessment at reserve matters or full planning application matters, or we can do it on the performance of a housing scheme post completion. So it can be a really useful tool at different stages of, um, of you know, the, of a housing housing development. Next slide, please. And just to illustrate this, in the same way that we might introduce design review as part of that um, planning determination, what I want to illustrate here is that sometimes building for healthy life can be just as useful as a tool to deliver that. And it's something that I suppose um, builds builds a multidisciplinary team together if you're bringing a site forward. And it, um, it can be proportionate, so you can come in at different stages in the use of building for a healthy life, but um, it helps facilitate that conversation. So at design concept stage, for example, an applicant may come to us and ask us to evaluate the potential of a site to achieve 12 greens. Then a pre-app consultation, a local authority, when it meets with an applicant, can be satisfied that the design parameters used on that, on that development have had independent scrutiny through assessment. A building for a healthy life review can take place where we give an assessment against the 12 considerations and an advice letter is issued that the applicant can use later on in their design and access statement. A scheme is developed in response to review and when it returns, we may do a second assessment review that will um, uh, um, guarantee almost that the scheme is meeting its potential pre-planning submission. And if that happens at, in parallel with public consultation, then it really does go, give a lot of beef to um, the design criteria. Um, being used in, in the development of that housing scheme. A case officer has that refer to refer to in the determination and an applicant um, can refer to those changes and show sort of the design story of its site in the design and access statement. The um, councillors really like it because it's a very transparent, um, easily recognisable tool um, to support determination. And also for house builders, when they do get approval for their sites, they can use it to promote and market their sites um, when, when they come to sell the homes on it. Now, next slide, please, Daniel. And this is my final slide, just to remind um, the audience today that Building for a Healthy Life and actually Streets for a Healthy Life as well is a really, can be a really useful tool for communities, uh, particularly um, in use on um, public consultation or co-design and neighbourhood planning um, preparation because it's 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 tried and tested and it's very robust and it can be extremely useful and a tangible tool to illustrate particularly if you use those the traffic light principles again and that's my presentation so I hope that was clear and it would be really useful in the second poll if we if you could let us know if you think a clear process on how to apply BHL and the and the planning process would be helpful to you. So yes, no, or not sure. Thank you very much. I think I'm passing over to Dan now, Dan Roberts. There you are, Dan. Hi, Julie, thank you. Yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, Dan Roberts from um, Homes England. Uh, I'm in the Master Development and Design team here at Homes England. And my particular remit is to do with design quality assessment and how we can try and improve the quality of our schemes that come through the agency. Next slide, please, Daniel. So what we've done to, uh, to, 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 to do that is to look at the way in which we can have best and maximum impact as a team on the processes that, that occur within the development service of uh, Homes England. And the basis upon which we do that is uh, using building for a healthy life as as the as the as the main tool as the common thread 
uh, between the different activities that take place as part of the delivery of schemes through Homes England. Next slide, please, Daniel. Building for a healthy life is just one of the various tools and techniques that we use, but it is the basis upon which we operate. Um, we started using Building for Life 12 back in, I think it was April 2019, and um, we updated it to Building for a Healthy Life in August 2020. Um, but we use Building for a Healthy Life in conjunction with many other tools and of course with particular regard as Annie mentioned earlier to the various government guidance and tools that are available through government not least the national model design code next slide please we chose to use building for life and now building for a healthy life because it does uh, reflect and um, complement the government's increased emphasis on design and sustainability in, in government policy. It's actually, I think, the only assessment tool that's referred to within government policy, and it's widely industry accepted. As Annie showed earlier, many local planning authorities now use Building for a Healthy Life or its predecessor uh, as part of their policy implementation. And so it made sense to us to, to, to use it as well. That said, it's a really good tool for us to use to improve design quality because it's place based. As many of you know, Homes England don't actually build homes. We rely on our development partners to do that. But the thing that we do do is set the context and the place, and we're heavily involved in that as an agency. So the fact that it's a place-based assessment tool was really important to us and, and a major consideration. It complements a lot of the, the um, processes and procedures that we're developing or have developed within the agency, but also it's great asset from our point of view is that it prompts you to ask and think about the right questions at the right time during the design process. And this diagram tries to demonstrate that in the fact that what we, we do, what we try to do is as we, as a project moves through from initial sort of site identification, site allocation, through outline consent towards detail and reserve matters consent, that we build upon those various sections of consideration that Building for Healthy Life uh, outlines. So we look at the first four considerations early on and try and get those right uh, and then build through the process. And that's really important because if those first four integrated neighbourhood considerations are missing, then it's really difficult, if not impossible, to retrieve those later on through the detailed uh, um, stages of, of, of a design. Next slide, please. The other thing that we use BHL for is to inform our design coding. Many of our larger sites have overall design codes attached to them, but what, what, what we're also doing is developing ways in which we can build coding into the delivery and, and future development of the sites as well. All of our sites need to be BHL uh, compliant and therefore all the codes that we produce or, or commissioned to be produced have to be BHL compliant as well. Next slide, please. This shows the way in which we, we build that through. So we have the initial assessment done of a site at the outline application stage. And that provides a threshold or baseline score, if you like, for us to for us to uh, use as we move the um, uh, the design, the development through the process. We then also, as part of the um, marketing of the um, of the site, as part of the the release disposal of the site, we look to use parcel codes, as we call them, which are codes based on that threshold assessment to help clarify to our development partners what we think needs to be delivered as part of that development. 
We then assess the score at the end as well with our preferred development partner to make sure that there has been no deterioration in standard through the process and hopefully that the, the, the site, uh, the scheme's um, design has actually improved as part of the process. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of the parcel codes that we use. They're, they're really simple and straightforward. So for each release of land, for each phase of development, we have a simple diagram with some accompanying narrative to explain what we think is most important as to, to, to be to be realized as part of that delivery phase. Next slide, please. This one here is a little bit more complicated because it could actually be two phases of release, but it was a former hospital site. And so on the right hand side, you can see there the more formal layout for the housing that we're proposing. On the left hand side, the previously undeveloped land, um, you can see a more informal layout is, is uh, proposed or recommended, but that, that needs to take account of the retained landscape features that form part of the uh, parkland surrounding the, the hospital before it was redeveloped. Next slide, please. We're, we're further refining this process as we work with it. And what we're looking to do now is create what we're calling musts and mores. So as part of the narrative, we define what must be delivered through the parcel code through this this phase of development and what more we think could be delivered and that might be the difference between us choosing one developer over another the simple diagram on the left hand side just shows where the the main features and access routes and relationship beyond the red line so for example in this case down the right hand side of the site there's a an, an historic green lane that needs to be um, considered as part of the development on the left hand side of the site there's a proposed new football ground so that needs to be taken into account as part of the development process just to emphasize these parcel codes actually uh, uh, often are supplementary to an overall code in this case the e extracted uh, diagram on the right hand side just shows you the way in which it fits into the overall code and the existing character areas that have been defined within that code. Again, just a simple diagram with some narrative to pull out the main assets, the main contributing design factors that we want to see delivered as part of this phase of development. So to recap, what we do is we look at the, the outline application and we create a predisposal assessment of that a, a, a threshold, if you like, a, a building for a healthy light th th threshold. That is done by the relevant design network panel for the area. That's really important to us as well because that gives the assessment some independence and impartiality. So that we're, we're not seen as marking our own sites, as it were, and therefore, um, um, uh, uh, it, it's it's a clean process as far as the agency is concerned. We then report that through our processes and we produce a parcel code. The assumption is that we will produce parcel codes, but there may be situations where we don't need to. Those are produced by the consultants that produce the master plan and they're based on that predisposal assessment report and the findings of it. That forms part of the ITT documentation, the documentation that goes out to market for the bidders to bid against. And we then review the preferred bidders submission and improve it, hopefully, towards reserve matters before it's submitted as a planning application to the local authority. As I say, we work very closely with the design network panels to get consistency across all regions of the country and crucially that impartiality as part of the process. And just to just to finish off, uh, uh, building for a healthy life, as I say, does form the basis of a lot of the work that we do. Um, Annie's mentioned earlier about the Streets for a Healthy Life document that's that's under development. We also 
uh, uh, engage with our development partners and our local authority partners, such as, for, for example, today. But we've also produced some short films based on the building for a healthy life considerations. And we're going to make those available to development partners and local authority partners uh, in due course, hopefully uh, around April, May time this year. We run internal design surgeries to make sure uh, that our, our projects are online throughout the process. And we, we engage with, with our various teams and services across the country in order to promote design quality assessment. We're also looking to create some site visit packs where, whereby we look at various schemes and, and uh, consider what's good and bad about them and, and, and draw that together in, into a sort of a, like a guided tour, if you like, a pack for, for people to visit the site themselves and look at them themselves and see if they agree uh, with, with our considerations. And finally, we, we do have a design champions network across our agency. We're only a very small team. The, the master development and design team is only six people strong, but we've got a network of champions right across all services and areas geographically uh, it, it, across the agency. Next slide, please. So the idea is, is that we create better places everywhere uh, by using Building for a Healthy Life. Thanks very much. I now pass on to Juliet. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, um, yes, hello, my name's Juliet Bidgood and I'm um, an architect and urban designer and I'm a design review panel chair in the Building for a Healthy Life assessor. And I'm going to talk some more about how Building for a Healthy Life is used in practice, focusing on a few case studies. Next slide, please. So um, as Julie and Dan have described, we use the standard as a benchmark to support design teams local authorities and homes England to shape attractive, healthy and sustainable places. And we do this at the beginning and at the end of projects alongside design review and pre-apps and also at the bid evaluation stage. Next slide, please. And um, I'm going to talk mainly about two case studies, but in this first one, um, I'm going to talk about a project at bid stage and I'm going to focus specifically on how creating a distinctive character for place is enabled by building for healthy life. And as we see here, um, defining character is important at the neighbourhood, place and street scale across the 12 considerations. And this example is at Coy Pool in Plymouth, and it's for a post-industrial site, um, which is on the northern edge of the city. And the site has um, an outstanding woodland context, but it is in a challenging location in the city because it's um, on the edge of the city, on the side of a slope, and it's only really accessible by one main new um, vehicle access and street, um, which is quite constrained for a big, a big site. So right from the outside, the idea of creating a new identity and creating a very legible layout was really important. And as Dan described, um, Homes England had commissioned a master plan for the site and that master plan set the context for the bids. It defined a layout and it coded certain design elements, setting quality fixes for the bidders to respond to. And also um, um, a building for healthy life draft assessment had been made and that highlighted ambers where there were still areas to develop in the um, bid designs. Next slide, please. And so in terms of building for a healthy life, one of the criteria is it's easy to find your way around. And um, when we assessed the schemes for um, Homes England, the winning scheme or the most successful scheme had been really strong in creating a street hierarchy and using the building massing, the arrangement of the physical arrangement of buildings to generate legibility. The primary route or the, the primary street in their proposal was really well composed, distinctive and varied. And one of the things the master plan had asked for was gaps in between the housing in the opening section of the street so that as you arrived in the place, you'd be able to have views out across the city of Plymouth. And not all of the bidders had really um, taken that on board. But the one that was most successful had done what the master plan set out, but it had also started to extend the master plan and add things. 
So they'd also introduced water to the main square, adding to legibility. And they'd also generated two additional focal points on the street, one by moving an older person's dwelling, which is quite a distinctive building onto the street, and another by including retail um, and a public space at the entrance to the site to kind of create a sense of space again as you arrived. Next slide, please. And then also in terms of Building for a Healthy Life, ask schemes to propose a memorable character and create places with either a locally inspired or otherwise distinctive character. And the successful pro pro proposal used a strong design team that worked well with architectural character to create a sense of place. And um, they'd paid attention to the character appraisal that had been already set out on the master plan and thought carefully about what's specific to Plymouth materially in their proposals. They'd followed through on the guidance on local character, on how tree planting should be um, handled and also on how parking should be well integrated into the site. And one of the things that they'd done again, which stood out, was that they'd proposed bespoke buildings um, to create distinctiveness on the corners. So they'd bought the apartment buildings which have more flexibility around their design onto the corners and um, really pushed the design of those buildings. Again, adding to the street scene. Next slide, slide please. Um, and in the chat, some of you have been asking about the relationship between building for a healthy life and building for nature and biodiversity net gain. So those um, design standards are very much embedded in the building for a healthy life approach. It's really important to see um, design teams understanding the land landscape context of a site, but then also adding to that with the proposal for green and blue infrastructure. And this proposal in Poipool works really well with the existing woodland, um, retaining it and enha enhancing it, but also making new relationships for future residents so that there were incidental play spaces and communal fruit and vegetable growing. Um, but as well as responding well to the existing landscape, they'd thought carefully about the um, habitats that were being created and were structuring the landscape so that it would result in a rich tapestry of interconnected habitats. And also, you can see in this illustration that they submitted, they're working quite carefully um, in terms of the sense of place they're creating between the material character of the landscape and the material character of the buildings. In terms of thinking about how character is part of um, the design team's thinking at all the different scales, at the street scale, um, what's assessed in Building for a Healthy Life is what's the design like of the back of pavement, between the back of pavement and front of home. And there you see how the character principles of the way that materials and landscape are being worked with are followed through in detail. And also you see how parking is being handled. And if it's not handled well, that can have a very negative impact on character. And generally, when thinking about how do we judge whether something that might seem quite subjective, like character, whether something's good or not, what you're really looking for is all of these different elements of landscape, materials, building massing, the roofscape, the fenestration, the quality of windows and the boundary trees, treatments all combine, all to combine and work together to create a distinctive character. Next slide, please. In this second case study, a building for healthy life assessment was made um, for a design team who were be between two phases of a master plan. And here I'm going to focus on how healthy streets, which Annie's spoken about, are at the heart of the new standard and what looks what good looks like in this respect. Again, we see how this aspect of streets and movement, as Annie highlighted, is a thread across the 12 considerations. So um, Port Loop in Birmingham is also a post-industrial site, but where, um, where Coypool had an almost semi-rural character, um, Birmingham, this spurt site in Birmingham has a very industrial character, and it's defined very much by its waterside canal location and um, the first phase of the of the larger master plan is already receiving design awards and we were giving advice to the architects Glen Howell architects and they had used building for life 12 in the development of their first phase 
And they wanted to just take a pause and think on what they would need to change in their approach in order to achieve building for a healthy life. And that was why they came to us to ask them um, what they needed to think about differently. So our first advice to them was really a very simple thing about the way evidence is presented. And the first um, three criteria or three considerations of building for a healthy life, natural connections, walking, cycling and public transport facilities and services. It's really good to see the approach to those strategic aspects of design demonstrated in the design and access statement and it being shown how the design team are thinking outside the red line and showing how they're connecting in to the surroundings. So we like to think of that and we sometimes talk about it in design review as thinking like a future resident. Next slide please. So the design team to we need to evidence that they've tested their thinking about how residents can walk to the nearest bus stop or cycle to a railway station, that they've thought about what the safe walking and cycling routes are to primary schools and secondary schools, and thought about where the nearest shops are to buy a pint of milk or other amenities and um, how they're connected to the site, and also to evidence how they are contributing to the strategic landscape corridors in the area. And all of these external connections, while the, while the development may or may not be able to influence them, should inform the internal street layout. So you can think about the street internal street layout really being like a spider's web with its um, set uh, linking out to a set of wider relationships. Next slide, please. And um, as well as thinking about the relationship to external relationships, of a site, um, building for healthy life asks assessors to think about what facilities and services and what amenities are being provided on site. And Port Loop is an interesting um, project and master plan because it, in the longer term, it plans to create innovative community-led amenity on space that it, innovative community-led amenity on site, which will include um, workspace and community um, amenities, but. Um, so that there is immunity for the first phases, they've thought of a way to make a meanwhile provision by providing a community room in a barge on the canal. So next slide, please. And then something um, that's more common to um, sites in general, that Building for a Healthy Life really asks us to pay attention to, is how um, health that well how health and well-being are supported by access to sociable outdoor spaces and the port loop scheme was doing really well in this this regard garden and um, in that there's a very strong landscape strategy that provides a diverse series of landscape spaces and these create a series of interesting shared and sociable spaces for residents that you can see in this um, site photo here but also in the uh, way that the um, gardens, front gardens and rear terraces are designed, there's a series of um, um, semi-formal and informal boundaries between private spaces and public spaces, which um, enable there to be social relationships between people's terraces and public spaces. Um, and another thing that we looked at with um, the Glen House team was whether they had provided balconies or semi-private gardens for all of their apartments. And when we looked at it closely with them, mostly they had. But again, this was something we said they should pay more attention to in future as Building for Healthy Life puts much more emphasis on this as a norm that you would expect for a norm for there to be some out, semi-private outdoor space for all apartments. Um, next slide, please. And uh, again, in these slides, you can see um, the there how the, the site shapes sort of different social and play opportunities but also um, in the way that the buildings overlook the canal, they, they have a series of um, semi-private terraces that overlook the canal, but also the master plan structures so that there are slipways, public slipways giving access to the canal and gardens that face onto the canal, public gardens that face onto the canal as well. Next slide, please. Um, and so also in terms of um, healthy streets, Annie was talking about how um, this is more stretching than in previously than in Building for a Healthy Life 12. 
And we really do want to see streets shared, street space shared fairly between pedestrians, cyclists and motor vehicles. And we know that lots of local authorities have not yet properly taken on board manual for streets. But nevertheless, we'd like to see active negotiations um, on the evidence for street for a healthy life principles to push um, good design standards in this regard with the highways authority. And building for a healthy life now encourages this kind of proactivity. So here um, for Glen Howells, we suggested that in meeting the challenge of adapting the industrial street grid, they might want to keep the kind of rigorous uh, linear grid character of those streets, but that when they come to adapt them, um, particularly the secondary streets in the second phase, we thought they should add more green greenness or tree planting in the street or possibly uh, parking to create friction and slow traffic further. And we thought also that they could push a bit further for pavements and cycleways that continue more cross, more strongly across side streets, which we're seeing um, nationally in exemplar projects like Nasdalan in Cornwall. Um, next slide, please. So um, also the Port Loop scheme was beginning to anticipate some of the expectations of building for a healthy life. Um, because much of its design is very innovative. And um, one of the things that they'd thought of a, a good solution to was how to integrate cycle parking um, in the front of the home. So all of the homes have um, cycle storage integrated in the front to make it as accessible as car parking and put it alongside um, electric vehicle charging also. And um, Generally, tree planting is well integrated to frame car parking spaces. And our caution to the design team on this solution was just to be careful not to put frontage car parking facing frontage car parking too often, if at all, in the second phase. Next slide, please. Um, I think Julie um, covered this um, in her presentation to some extent, but it's just really to highlight how um, another way that we use building for healthy life is as part of a design review process for all of those local authorities that have it as their adopted standard across the country, where they might say they want to see X number greens before they'll approve a proposal. And we found it's very good for strategic projects with multiple phases. And what we'll do is when we design review the scheme, we'll, we'll also do a parallel building for a healthy life assessment and we'll give reds and ambers to the areas of concern and that really can focus the attention of the design team on where they need to develop their thinking further and um, if we do um, subsequent building for a healthy subsequent design reviews then we'll expect to see the reds and ambers reduce as the pre-application progresses so again it's another way to sort of really hone in on what needs to change in order to make a strong scheme. Um, next slide, please. So now it's time to hear from you and we'll be launching our last poll and we'd like you um, to answer and the results will be coming up in the chat. So that's encouraging that so many of you um, would like to see more case studies and it's an incentive for us to um, track the good examples that, that we see going as we as we um, interact with projects across the country. So the key messages of, of, um, of what the four of us have talked about are that we want to just really highlight the role of building for a healthy life as an actual practical tool that you can use actively at different stages of the development process. And we think it's becoming a very strong and gritty tool for promoting successive improvement in design and with its special emphasis on um, good character discourages the generation of more of the same or same places it really um, encourages design teams to be more disciplined in generating distinctiveness and also um, it integrates ambitious approaches to healthy street design and encourages more specific approaches to character and um, because of the uh, important role of the NHS and thinking around place, it puts a strong emphasis on the social dimension of places and the role of public and landscape spaces in housing developments. So um, those are our key messages and we'll be look forward to um, hearing what you have 
have to say. But now I'm going to hand back to Abby for the Q&A. Thanks, Julia. That was really interesting. Um, and yeah, thank you to all our speakers for those really interesting insights. And um, I really enjoyed those case studies to really sort of bring those design codes to life as well, um, particularly the Port Loop case study, as I used to take my lockdown walks there when it was still very much brownfield land. So it's really brilliant to see that um, sort of bustling community that's been built there. So um, we're now moving on to the Q&A portion of the event um, and we've spotted loads of really um, good questions coming through in the chat while our speakers have been talking. Um, so thank you everyone for really engaging with this. I'm going to kick off the Q&A um, with a question that is going to be aimed at Dan, um, Dan Roberts from Homes England um, and then Juliet as well. I think you have a, a little bit to add as well. So. How does um, building for a healthy life dovetail in with building with nature and um, the biodiversity net gain? Thank you, Abby. Yeah, uh, to a certain extent, I think Juliet's probably already answered this, but there are a couple of considerations within building for a healthy life that point towards the the um, the the biodiversity and sustainability green sustainability elements of design. There's making the most of what's there. And there's also the green and blue infrastructure uh, considerations. Now, I think it's fair to say that um, building for a healthy life is a little bit light on these two on on, the, on this subject. Um, and by by the author's own admission, it was created a little bit before the government started to emphasise this through their current round of policy. And I know that this coming year. Um, uh, Design for Homes, the creators of uh, Building for a Healthy Life, are looking to sort of update and revise Building building for a Healthy Life. And, and I would imagine that there will be a little bit more emphasis placed on this. But that said, it's, it's entirely right, as the questioner points out, that you should be using other tools and techniques alongside Building for a Healthy Life. So, for example, Building with Nature is an excellent tool to use where uh, nat naturalistic um, uh, circumstances uh, mean that you've got to consider those side of things a lot more than you would do normally. Uh, there's certain sites that that might be sort of reclaimed or have a, a high bio biodiversity um, level on them already, and so it would be good to assess them over and above what you can do th through building for a healthy life. Uh, as it as it stands so so yes absolutely use the tools that are there and available in in companion with building for a healthy life where where necessary juliet do you have anything further i uh, just just i suppose it's just that the the building for a healthy life is really a sort of a tool isn't it for conversation behind which lots of technical more technical or more detailed guidance can kind of be pulled in but i think it's always been really good at um, making sure that landscape infrastructure is really integral to how you think about whether it's a good scheme or not and encouraging things like the strong use of street trees or thinking about how people and nature um, are brought together in developments so it seems a good framework for thinking about those things yeah that's all I'd have to add thanks Dan it's it's the right prompt isn't it it's the prompt mm. that brings those other considerations in which is which is the main sort of basis of it really the thinking behind it brilliant thank you um we have another question for dan um so is there a publicly accessible document that sets out homes england's approach to coding for development sites that's a good question. Uh, the answer is, is that we're working on it. Uh, one of my colleagues within the master development and design team is looking at the various codes that we've had done on our behalf that we've commissioned and also some exemplars and best examples from, from elsewhere across the country and the way in which that they sort of coordinate with the national model design code. And um, uh, looking at the looking at what they have produced, what's been good, what's been lacking. And we're going to sort of try and form our own checklist for design coding uh, for, for when we commission design codes as uh, on behalf of, of, of um, Homes England. So that document, that checklist, if you like, is, is, um, is under preparation and hopefully will be ready later on, you know, June, the summer, something like that this year. 
but it, uh, obviously it will complement the national model design codes uh, requirements but th there are certain things i guess that homes england do that you know the coding mechanism needs to needs to be sharper on or, or or emphasize and so that's the that's the point of that document we've also produced a very sort of short guidance note for our um our, our colleagues internally on parcel codes the production of parcel codes what they cover i mean it's literally a couple of sides of a4 but there's no reason why that can't form a supplement to to the document that I was just referring to uh, and be made available to to external partners as well. So, yeah, good, good idea. Good point. And it's something that we're working on. Great. So a bit of watch this space on this one. Did you have anything to add, Juliet? No, no problem. Great. Um, and I do have another question for Dan. So um, <laughs> one more for you, uh, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the panel again. Um, but when um, when you mentioned that Homes England development should comply with building for a healthy life, does this include all developments on Homes England's land? Uh, essentially, yes, that's what we're working towards. We started with BHL for our disposals teams, which is part of the development service. But what we're looking to do in subsequent years, I mean, and, and so I should say that forms part of the um, the KPI, the key performance indicator for disposals in our new strategic plan, which which uh, is likely to be adopted from April. Uh, that, that that's the intention anyway. That for the for the new financial year, so we started with development services and in particular the disposal side of that, but we're looking to 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 make sure it embraces all of our our services. So that's our investment in pro program, which would include the affordable housing program, our acquisitions um, um, considerations, uh, and 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 um, uh, other aspects of them. Um, of of the uh, agency's services um but i think it's fair to say that not all of our not all of our schemes or the schemes that homes england are involved in are going to be 100% compliant uh, that's the reason why we're doing these predisposal assessments and and forming a threshold for each site that we deal with uh, Homes England doesn't or shouldn't uh, get involved in 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 development sites unless they're failing. Uh, you know, if the market can deliver deliver them, then Homes England shouldn't be involved. So almost by definition, we tend to pick up or get involved in sites that are quite awkward or difficult to develop. And so the whole thinking behind this idea of, of establishing a threshold at the, at the word go is to make sure that we're we're being realistic about what can be delivered on that site there might be certain considerations certain aspects of bhl that just aren't achievable on some of our sites sites that we've inherited from other government departments or that come our way because they're failing in the market and we and we acquire them in order to try and develop them so you know for example in in uh, there are instances where we're setting the threshold at seven or eight um uh, greens um uh, of, of of bhl uh, the, the others would have to be amber uh, um, we wouldn't want to be sort of taking on any sites or, or promoting any sites that were that were read uh, in terms of the the coding of BHL. But we realised that not all of them will be able to achieve twelve out of twelve by the very nature of the sites that we're uh, that that we're involved in. But yes, that they they all need to be BHL compliant as far as they can be based on the threshold assessment that the Design Networks panels does for us. Can I go now? Yeah, you can have a break. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, sort of open it, opening back out to the wider panel. Um, really interesting, Dan, that you've mentioned sort of predisposal. So, looking at the other end of the spectrum, um, someone's asked: um, Are the places um, surveyed after a number of years to see if they have achieved their uh, healthy design outcomes? I, I, I'll start this one off, shall I? You can't get rid of me, can you? But just to say that, that, that that's our intention. What we're doing is we're assessing our schemes at the threshold, the reserve matters stage, and then what we're hoping to do is is to assess them on completion as well. And then as obviously as the as longevity allows, we will then look at, at perhaps doing some post occupant uh, occupancy surveys too to see that the quality isn't diminishing once they're they're 
being lived in and they're part of the the built environment as it were rather than just a scheme or, or a freshly delivered scheme so that's our intention but of course we're not there yet because that, that we're only dealing with schemes really that are in proposal at the moment as far as BHL are concerned. In about two or three years time hopefully we'll be seeing some of those delivered on site and we'll be able to 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 assess them on completion and then subsequently uh, as post occupancy but that, that's certainly our intention yes yeah. Great thanks Dan. Okay um, another question we've had is um, do secure by design principles link in any way to building for a healthy life? I think um, I'll have a go at starting it if you want. Um, I think kind of the, the foundation points of uh, secure by design are embedded in BHL in the sense that it's in favour of perimeter blocks, creating secure blocks. It doesn't favour anything that creates kind of space left over after planning. It doesn't want you to have leftover spaces that aren't overlooked. It's kind of a fundamental kind of starting point for it. I don't think it explicitly re references uh, secured by design in the document, but certainly the good design principles which are embedded in secured by design are kind of in BHL as well. Absolutely. And those the, things like that, the back of pavement, front of home, where you're looking at the way in which the, the properties will surveil the, the, the public realm, but also creating that little bit of defensible space between the public realm and, and, and the private properties, which is also something that Secured by Design alludes to. Then, yeah, the, 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 the basic principles of Secured by Design are, are covered within building for a healthy life but again it's it's, it's similar to the, the the nature question we had earlier secured by design uh, can be complemented by and complements BHL so if if you wanted to as part of the assessment of, of, of a scheme you could you could use BHL and secured by design in partnership brilliant thank you both um, we've had a question about inclusive streets um, and I wonder if anyone has any sort of ideas on on how to answer this one. So um, how does building for a healthy life factor in the needs of different groups? So um, for an example, um, maybe people on the um, autism spectrum, people with dementia or those with hearing or visual needs. So sit, sort of um, thinking about dementia friendly neighbourhoods as an example um, and which adaptations are likely to be beneficial for everyone. Any ideas? It's quite a specific question. I know we did have a session on inclusive streets earlier in the week, which we will have on YouTube I, later on. So, I, yes, Juliet, did you want to come so in? I think the RTPI has done some um, initial work on this, but I think it's an area where there probably will be a lot more thinking going forward. But um, I think making a legible place that's got distinctive landmarks, that sort of part of building for a healthy life is the idea of making um, street networks that are um, legible and memorable, Mem you know, the idea of making memorable places with more sort of visual clues um, about where you are are helpful, but also I think the uplift to building for a healthy life where more priority is given to um, pedestrian movement will make places safer for older people with dementia, but also for children as well. I suppose it depends very much on the location, but I think it's sort of an area of um, of uh, future research and development in a way. I don't know if anybody else has got any thoughts on that. Yeah, we started to touch on it a little bit in Streets for a Healthy Life. So as part of the conversation and kind of um, background research that we did, we had a number of chats around neurodiversity and street design and about how, like you say, Juliet, you design kind of legible places particularly clutter-free places that aren't overwhelming um, for people using the streets. So that was a, so in the case studies that we've collated, we have considered, although it doesn't explicitly say it within the document, but it was certainly kind of part of our background research that informed that document and the case studies that we selected. I think there's also the basic point that good design is inclusive design. And, and, and when you add together uh, so-called minorities they often form the, uh, uh, form the majority of the of the of the populace that we're we're designing for so so 
you know, all the, all these matters need to be taken into consideration in order to make designs of his, as inclusive and as uh, accessible as possible. Um, and, and that makes it a good design. So we, we, we um, whilst it's really important to make sure that the individual considerations are taken account of, we shouldn't really be designing for specific groups. We should be just doing good, inclusive design wherever. And that means then that all, all members of society are accepted into and can use it properly. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. Um, thank you all. Um, I'll go in with one more question. Um, it was a really popular question that came up a couple of times in a few different formats. Um, but um, moving away from car use and sort of changing behaviours around that um, and how do we start to do this, especially in existing streets rather than just focusing on new builds? Um, do you have any sort of suggestions or good practice or ideas around that? Both from uh, the point of view of streets for a healthy life and building for a healthy life is it is entirely focused on new residential streets. So I think that's kind of the, the starting point for that question. I think retrofitting is a separate process um, and it goes through a separate approval process than uh, new build residential streets do. So I think the process that you go through would have to be considered quite separately. It's not something that we looked at in Streets for a Healthy Life, but there are a number of other good practice guidance. I know in the Nottingham Street Design Guide um, looks to a degree at retrofit. Might be helpful, I can put a link to the chat in that. And there's some good London examples that talk about retrofit as well, but Building for a Healthy Life and Streets for a Healthy Life do focus very kind of um, purposely on new build residential streets, but I absolutely agree. It's a really important area for consideration. Um. D Design Midlands are actually, um, we have a, a model called yeah. Shaping Streets Design Review, where we aim to bring a multidisciplinary panel together to, to interrogate existing streets and see how there could be um, a reclaiming of the street back to make it more pedestrian friendly. So if um, people do have any queries about that particular process, I think making it holistic, making it multidisciplinary and making it very collaborative and, you know, um, investigating some of these ideas is a good sort of method to try and um, counteract some of these obstacles to um, more people friendly environments on existing streets. It's quite a challenge. And um, the High Street Task Force, for example, are are battling with that issue as well, aren't they? It's, um, it's not just uh, a new sort of new high streets that we need to be worrying about really brilliant i think um we'll take that as a an opportunity to to close off the q a um and just say a massive thank you to all of our brilliant speakers today um thank you so much for coming along um and taking the time to speak for us and uh thank you as well to the audience for lots of brilliant questions and engagement as well um, our contact details are on this slide and the contact details of our speakers as well. So if you did want to visit those websites, please do. I'm sure they'll be delighted to hear from you. Um, and thank you again to our speakers for a brilliant session and for all of your work on this and for sharing all of those insights with us. That is the end of our session. So please do feel free to drop off and thank you so much for attending. <laughs>